Hello, welcome back to Brian. Um, I hope you have enough seats. I see one in the background. Uh, feel free to take it. Let me see if we have Andy in line. Andy? Hello. Hey, Andy. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Then I guess the sound is working. Yes. Yes, yes, it is. Um, do you have your slides ready? My slides are shared already. There we are. They are. They are. Okay. I'll, I'll kick you off then. Tell us about the spec whenever you knew we needed. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening as appropriate to time zones. Uh, and uh, today I'm talking about reliability, the spec you never knew you needed. Uh, I am Andy Funninger. I'm a senior engineer at Bloomberg in our data services platform scale and reliability team. Um, a little bit about Bloomberg. We sell data and analysis. So my department's API gateway service allows applications at Bloomberg to get market data from each other. This is billions of requests per day. So of course, it's important to us that this be reliable. Of, of course, all my examples today are made up. They're not related to any actual systems, except maybe the random number generator in Microsoft Excel. So let's consider something. What would it look like if we were missing a specification for our system? If we didn't have a spec for the color of our UI, we'd keep getting prompted to change it. We'd get a ticket that says, please make the UI a little more red. And then we get an email that says, hey, I, I looked at the UI this morning. It needs a little bit more green. Next thing you know, you're in a meeting and someone says, oh, let, let's put a little more pizzazz in the UI. So what would you do? Well, you'd call a meeting, get all the stakeholders together, and come up with a spec. Then you would maintain that spec. Users, the product team, whoever owns it may change that spec over time. But if it changes without an intentional change, then in your QA process, you're going to call it a regression, and you're going to fix it. So when we look at complaints about reliability, they tend to look about the same. So when you get a ticket, it says the system's down and explains that it's not really down, it's just too slow. And then someone calls and says, uh, oh, we, the error rate at 5 p.m. Is, is too high. And then you put on your yearly plan that you want to reduce downtime then sooner or later, you're in a meeting that says, let's build a whole new system to address stability concerns. The thing is, our response is a little bit different. We build a new system or we add some new features to an existing system, and then we release it. Uh, hopefully, everybody's happy, but users provide feedback somewhat sporadically. Uh, product provides some feedback, too. Engineering tags these as maintenance or bugs or whatever and works on them uh, until people stop complaining. Now, once the feedback stops, the work stops. What if we did this a little bit different? What if uh, we wrote specifications for speed, error rates, and failures? We got a new system that's already meeting the specifications at release. Since we know what the specifications are, we'll have built-in monitoring for this, and we can even plan for the capacity. Users know what to expect, and they should be talking to us when either their expectations change or we're not meeting what we plan to meet. What does daily operations look like now? Well, incidents that meet these specs are prioritized. When you go to do maintenance, you know just how careful you need to be. Engineering discusses changes with product, whether that's a new feature that's going to make things slower, or whether it's the need to put performance work in to enable future new features. 
product prioritizes all work if reliability suffers you block releases just like any other regression clients now have a very clear way to request improvements and in fact the specs may change over time and that could be upwards or downwards product may say well you know what the features are important <laughs> So we're going to lower the specification. Now you can monitor to that new spec. This replaces the old, don't fix that yet. We need to push forward with features with an actual question. How do we get here? Well, let's put some definitions around this. Service level indicators are special metrics. They are metrics that are important to your clients and they are quantitative measures reflecting the health of the service aggregated over time. They're observable and of concern to your clients. SLOs are agreed upon targets, service level objectives are agreed upon targets for which the service level indicators must be met over a longer time period. Service level agreements are legal documents committing to a level of SLIs for clients. I will not be talking further about service level agreements other than to say they usually have penalties and they usually involve lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer. Uh, they're a whole topic in, in and of themselves and they will not be covered in the rest of this talk. Now we have a definition for reliability. Reliability is simply are we meeting our SLOs? So let's go ahead to some simple sample SLIs. The ratio of homepage requests that loaded in less than 100 milliseconds could be a latency measure. Percent of accurate responses could be correctness. 99th percentile of records processed per second would be throughput minutes available in non-degraded state would be availability. But remember, our service level objectives are never absolute and never instant. We typically measure the SLIs over a month and we apply a percentile or rolling average to the SLI. So you would set your SLI, SLO at 99th percentile ratio of homepage requests that loaded in the last in less than 100 milliseconds over the last 30 days. 30 day rolling percentage of accurate responses. 30 day rolling 99th percentile records processed per second. 30 day rolling minutes available in non-degraded state. Let's look at some corollaries here. Uh, if we have an objective then we have some amount of allowed errors and that's our error budget. It may be quite small, but it is non-zero. We also have some rate at which our application is failing at the moment, hopefully quite low, but that is our error rate. And then the rate at which that error budget is being consumed by the error rate is our burn rate. So, Pull up an example. Uh, if we have a web service that takes a million requests per month and has a hundred millisecond average response time, we might say a request is successful if there are no errors, we returned the correct data, and we took less than 200 milliseconds to respond. How do we get these numbers? Well, as an example, in a new system, we know that the other systems need this kind of response time to meet their SLOs. In an existing system, we look at the fact that the clients are happy today and we leave a room, we leave a little room from our current performance. Of course, we also need a time component. So we're going to aim high and say 99.99% successful requests over the last 30 days. 
This is four nines. How does this translate? Well, our error budget is 100 failures per month. Um, or if we translate it into time, 4.38 minutes per month. <clears throat> now, it's not exactly 4.38 minutes. It's unlikely that we have a consistent uh, distribution of traffic, but this is telling us that any downtime we have has to be on the order of four minutes or less per month. If we are saying, okay, we're going to run on a single physical machine and we're going to yank it down and we're going to occasionally do maintenance, no, you're not. Um, if you're going to say we're going to run on a very hard to build virtual machine and it's going to take 15 minutes to build, no, you are not. Um, if you have something that's going to take 15, 30 seconds to rebuild, you might consider getting away with that and doing your maintenance that way. Or you might be looking at the fact that as most systems, you need multiple parallel machines that can do a hot failover. So let's look at some possibilities. Let's consider the possibility that a component causes an SLO miss. So let's say ground truth, our processing takes about 70 milliseconds and it ch authentication changes so that the cache miss penalty on authentication increases to 150 milliseconds. So anytime we have a authentication that does not hit the cache, it's going to take 220 milliseconds to process that request. And we are going to miss our target every single authentication. So what are our options? Well, engineering goes to product and shows them that this is the situation. And product says, uh, well, we could just turn off authentication. We don't really need it. Fine, done. You've, you've re-achieved your SLO. Uh, engineering can go to the authentication team or provider and say, we need this to be a little bit faster. Can you speed this up a little bit? And they can even say, we need you to shave 20 milliseconds off. Uh, 30 would be better, 50 would be better. Engineering can change the design. If we have 70 milliseconds processing, 150 milliseconds authentication, we could do all the processing in parallel with the authentication. Or product could change the SLO. Product could say, yeah, 220 milliseconds, it's fine. Also, your environment might cause an SLO miss. So let's say you're using some kind of virtual machines, Kubernetes or something, and occasionally a request hits an incompletely provisioned instance. This happens about 50 times per month. Um, if we provision more often, then we would breach our SLO. So let's say we decide to make uh, idle instances be cleaned up more frequently. We start breaching our SLO and product might go, uh, engineering, we, we need you to fix this. Engineering could say, okay, we're going to keep more spare instances. Or engineering might say, uh, you know what? We're going to take the hit. This is happening now 70 times a month but we're gonna go make the authentication faster so that we're not getting a, a failure on both. And of course, you might change the SLI. It might make sense, especially if each client is getting their own instance to say, okay, we're not gonna count hits that go to an incompletely provisioned instance. That's not generally ideal but it's an option. So how do you find your service level indicators? Well, ideally your product team would know. 
they know what's important to your clients, whoever's owning the product should know. When they don't, or when they ask you how to figure it out, uh, there are some other options. Uh, one, your, your customers do know. Um, they know what's important to them. They may, in fact, already be telling you. When they are giving you feedback, they're giving feedback in certain terms. Those terms show what indicators they are looking at. And those are, if not exactly your service level indicators, candidates. You can also look at similar systems elsewhere, elsewhere in your company or your competitors. In general, you're going to wind up with something that can be expressed as a number of good events over a number of valid events. So good events under 200 milliseconds, valid events, excluding authentication. Generally, you're going to look for SLIs in terms of latency, throughput, correctness, availability, and error rate, but literally whatever matters to your clients is what your service level indicators are. This is client focused. There's also some techniques you can use. And of course, each of these are their own talk. Uh, if you're request focused, you can use the red technique and say, what's my rate of requests? What's my error rate? What's my duration on requests? If you're, use, uh, if you're infrastructure focused, then use suggests looking at utilization, saturation, and errors. Uh, then we come to how do you set your service level objectives? Well, again, product team should know, but if sales and product are two different groups, sales is quite likely advertising something and whatever they are advertising, those are becoming your SLOs. Um, you can also check your current performance for satisfied customers. Uh, that's also another good indicator of what the expectations on your system are. Once you have them, what do you do? Well, first of all, check them regularly. Every week, every month, look at where your SLIs are compared to your SLOs. And if you're seeing a trend there, you have time to take action. Remember, these are 30-day averages. So from week to week, they shouldn't be trending in anything short-term. Even a small outage should cancel out. So now you have time to fix issues and adjust plans. You might say, okay, next sprint, we need to put a performance boost in. If you're consistently beating your service level objectives, <clears throat> you can consider offering a better objective to your clients, uh, especially if that has a benefit to you. You can also use these once you have them to manage capacity and resources. If you have plenty of room between your SLI and your SLO, then you probably don't need to add more resources. If you're thinking about adding more resources, <clears throat> and you're close, then you need to add resources at least proportionate. And this is a valuable input to your resource planning. You'll also want to use them for alerting, but it's not terribly useful to get an alert that says over the last 30 days, things have started going bad. Instead, you want to look at your error budget. So, Take one minus your SLO, essentially that's your error budget. Then you can look at your system and say, what is your instantaneous error rate or what's your error rate over the last five minutes? And calculate how fast your error budget will be expended at the current error rate. So canceling out the time turns, terms, error rate over error budget, you get a burn rate. 
If your burn rate is less than one, you're basically fine. Uh, you're not expecting to breach your SLOs and, and things are, are fine. If your burn rate is one exactly, then at the end of the month, you will exactly meet your SLO. So that probably requires some attention, but is probably fine. If your burn rate goes up to two, you're going to breach your SLO in about 15 days for a 30 day SLO. In this case, you definitely need to take a look at it probably on the next business day. If your burn rate goes up to 30, you're going to breach your SLO in one day. And that requires action pretty much immediately. It, it's today's problem. If your burn rate goes up to 720, you're going to breach your SLO in an hour. And you really do need to call someone. Uh, that is a call out. This will let you have your alerting tied to what your clients actually care about. To sum up, speed is usually a feature, but reliability is always a feature. If reliability is a feature, then we have a spec. If we have a spec, it comes from product. If we don't meet our specs, then we need to either fix it or change the specs. Reliability, however, is a complex feature. It involves both time and probability, and regressions are not intuitive. In fact, your regressions are very likely to turn up in prod. Continuous monitoring is required, and the issues in reliability may come from the environment or underlying systems. In fact, depending on how you have things organized, this may be the one feature not owned by the development team. You may have an operations team that actually owns reliability. Nothing says they have the ability to fix it. So where do you go to learn more? Well, this is SRE. So you wanna to go to your friendly local system reliability engineer if you have an SRE team, that's where they are. If you don't, you may find them sitting in the DevOps team, the operations team, or the release team, and they would love to talk to you. There is no reason why they can't be seated on a dev team. There's no reason why you can't become the expert on this. Um, the best starting source is the Google SRE books sre.google slash books, uh, and SRECon 2021 is coming around in October. Uh, of course, that will be fully online, so there is uh, lots of opportunity to attend. I think it might be virtually placed in the Western United States, um, but again, <laughs> uh, travel means nothing right now. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks, Andy. So first question we have, how do we ensure that products will be prioritizing important fixes that caused incidents in the past? So there's two answers here. Um, first of all, important is defined as what's important to product. Mm -hmm. So if product doesn't care about the incidents, they aren't important and you don't need to fix them. Um, in all probability, they do care about the incidents, uh, and then you, you need to deal with, they need to prioritize, and that's, that's almost a, a flat question entirely aside from this. <laughs> Other thing is, if you look at this, uh, nowhere in here, let me go back to, yeah, this will go. Nowhere in here do I exclude incidents. So if you have an incident that takes the system down for 15 minutes, you have failed the SLO. 
and all the metrics that both engineering and product are looking at um, are all blown. And that should be enough to drive them into prioritizing it. Right, because the SLO is written by product and engineering, right? So they are aligned in that. Cool. Ideally, it'd be great if you could get product to write the SLOs entirely. Mm -hmm. But in reality, product is not going to come up with an SLO in numbers that are measurable in your system. Mm -hmm. They might come up with something but engineering is going to have to help them rephrase it into something that is measurable, understandable, monitorable, et cetera. Um, and that's uh, the part where engineering has to help write it. Makes sense. Thanks, Andy. And last question, how do we define the starting specs for SLOs without, without having the accurate metrics in the first place? There's a reason why this entire talk starts with SLIs. <laughs> okay, you cannot you cannot jump straight to objectives without indicators. Uh, you need to start there, and those are not easy. Uh, as much <laughs> as the talk may jump through suggesting that it is, um, I don't know who answered this. Who raised this question? Um, do you want to know how you do SLIs without how you start writing the metrics for SLIs? Or is that really the answer that you start with the SLIs? So I, I can tell you the, um, the original question, which may, may give, may give more, but the, the, the asker is, is writing in the chat. So I'll, I'll be able to relate to you. So initially the question was, how do we define the starting specs? What if we can't count on users or clients to give us accurate numbers? Okay. So usually this means that you have a new system. Hmm. If you have a new system, uh, then what you need to do is talk to product sales yourself and say, what do I need to be able to sell this thing or to make this thing usable? So what does it need to go into the market? What does it need uh, for competitive advantage? What does it need for users to use it? What does it need to demo well? Uh, those become your starting approximations. And from there, you can you can run the whole process forward. Um, of course, as you do get real users, there's a very good chance of having some changes. Um, they, like any other feature, there's a there's a chance that you'll change and say, okay, um, all of a sudden, we didn't think we needed to worry about latency because all of our users were supposed to be batch. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that, you know, the maximum allowed latency is actually five minutes, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we, we do actually need to monitor that, even though five minutes sounds like such a tremendous uh, span of time compared to, you know, our throughput of a million data points per second. Well, some people are actually sending in whatever, five, 300 million data points. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to handle a five minute latency uh, just so that we can say, um, you know, that we're going to, for example, reject very large requests if we can't handle a large request because we're fully loaded, uh, we'll reject it. And that would be a way to meet that sort of SLO. Mm -hmm. If you put a five minute latency in and you say, well, um, at times that we cannot handle very large requests, you will get an error. Right, so you can start from the SLOs to figure out what SLIs you need to, to set them, right? Um, yeah, you. I mean, the only way you can start from the SLOs to get to the SLIs would be if you have 
a competitor, and then you just mm -hmm. copy their SLOs. Um, a competitor or a, a direct requirement. If you have a service-oriented architecture and you have something like a, a full process going through your company, you can talk to the services that are going to call your service and they'll say, well, <laughs> we have 100 milliseconds. That's it. Right. <laughs> right. Makes sense. Thanks, Andy. Um, thanks again for coming. We we have run out of time, um, and we have now. I'll, I'll need you to pronounce your name for me. Um, <laughs> I'll pop over to the breakout room. Cool. I'll see you later.